So this is part two, and it's again work with uh, Alexander Itz and Igor Krasovsky. Uh, now, uh, there's a, so the archive reference for the paper, paper is at 1207. There's a second archive paper which also appeared in the, oh, sorry. Thank you. And there's a second pa pa paper which will, uh, which contains the details of much of what we're going to talk, talk about to, to today, which is asymptotics of toplets, Hankel, and toplets of supposed Hankel determined with fisher hartwick Sing singular uh, sing uh, singularities, and this particular topic has a subtitle, which uh, is a little bit mysterious, and you'll see why it's called the story of hidden aliases and concealed identities. So, uh, let me recall. Uh, just I'll spend a couple of minutes recalling what I did yesterday. Here's a strong Zago limit theory, a theorem or SSLT. We've got a function which is uh, sufficiently smooth on the circle. Non-zero has winding number zero. Then the uh, toplet de de determinant, which is constructed from the Fourier co coefficients of f, has asymptotics given by this exponentially growing term and with this all-important uh, con constant term where these quant quantities here are the Fourier co coefficients of log f. Now, uh, I just want to take a mo moment. Uh, there's a very beautiful interpretation, which I think is due to Joe uh, Johansson, of this result in terms of a central limit theorem. So if you go into ran random matrix theory, this particular quantity over here, which appeared in the talk yesterday, in terms of the Heine type representation of toplets de determinants actually has the meaning of the probability distribution function for the eigenvalues of a unitary ma uh, matrix. So the uh, eigenvalues are e to the i theta j when you put ha ha measure on un. It's one of these beautiful connections. Uh, so now, the inter interpretation is the following. We let Hn, so little h is some given fun uh, function. I'll say a little bit more, more about it la later. And you let Hn of theta be h evaluated at all these eigenvalues. Then for any t, we have that the expected value of e to the r t Hn. So Hn is clearly a function on the unitary group. So we can take its expectation with respect to ha, ha measure. That just works out to be this quan quantity here, which we observe is just the toplets determined for this particular symbol, e to the rth. So if h is real, real valued with mean, mean zero by the strong Zago limit theorem, this quantity over here will converge to this quantity over here, uh, which is just where, because h is real, the i's come out, you get the min minus sign, and because h is real, h of minus k is h of k, k bar. And we should put these things over here. And because this is quad, uh, quadratic, we see that essentially the Fourier tran wha what we're saying is the Fourier transform of the distribution function for hn is converging to this uh, Gaussian type qu quantity that's a characterization to tell you that this particular random variable is converging as a central limit theorem to a Gaussian distribution with this particular variance or uh, stand standard, standard deviation. So in other words, the strong Zago limit theorem can be viewed as a central limit theorem, a very elegant. Also, you notice there's no, s uh, no w uh, n to the minus half factor which is placed and that's, that's testament to the fact that the eigenvalues of a ran random matrix are very regularly spaced out. It's just a side piece of information. Okay, so, um, all right, now uh, I want to go to the other one to recall some of the facts. So I just want to tell you very, just recall, recall again that uh, 
Fisher and Hartwick were led uh, as a result of some problems which arose and we discussed in uh, the I Ising model to considering symbols which had certain kinds of sing singularities uh, which are now called Fisher-Hartwick sing singularities. These singularities will allow for the fact that your symbol F the symbol F can have zeros, it can have integrable singularities, it can have discontinuities and non-zero winding. So that covers the, the ground. So the symbols look like this, which I will leave up. Uh, this is your regular piece. So for all these alphas and beta of a zero, you'd just be in the case for the classical. Okay. Sorry. I'll try to. I, I don't have a pointer. Uh, maybe I can try. <laughs> okay. Come in this way around. So this uh, piece over here, the e to the minus v, is the regular piece. This particular piece over here, that gives you your sing singularities uh, on the circle and allows for the possibility that uh, Z can vanish. This is what gives you the winding and the discontinuities. Discon and there's just a norm normalization factor. This piece over here goes together with that. And what this uh, function G is, given over here, it's piecewise con constant, it's equal to e to the i pi beta j, when theta is between zero and theta, theta j, and on the rest of the circle, z to the minus that quantity. V is some, uh, something smooth. Uh, now, uh, I'll probably leave this up in, in, in a moment. There are some e examples which I want to d discuss. Um, the, fir the first example, if you just take a function which is piecewise constant, it has a value minus i in the upper hemisphere or the upper circle, upper part of the circle, and plus i on the lower, lower part. That gives rise to a Fisher-Hartwick sing singularity with two singular points, z0 is 1, z, uh, z1 is min minus 1. The alphas are 0, but the betas are a half and a minus a half. It, the details are not too important. The main thing is you see that this type of singularity can be written in this form. Okay. A, uh, the one on the bottom. Okay. This is the form for when f is equal to plus or minus i. A different pro, uh, pro kind of problem is suppose you've got a function f, which is unimodal, so it increases on one part, part and decreases on, uh, on, uh, on the other. And uh, suppose it's got two zeros, uh, and at point z1 equals e to the i theta, theta 1 and z2 equals to e, e to the i theta, theta, theta 2, you take alpha 1, alpha 2 equals a half, beta 1, beta equals plus a half, beta 2 equals min, minus a half. Then f can also be written in this form uh, where you see all the features of a Fisher-Hartwick singularity are now active. There are betas and there are alphas and there is some smooth part. Now, uh, why this particular example is important is for the following reason. We can think of F as being C minus lambda, where lambda is a number between the minimum of C and the maximum of C. Now, it's a simple observation that the determinant of this toplets matrix with the symbol C minus lambda is the determinant of Tn. I it's the determinant of the toplets matrix with the symbol phi minus lambda. So. What you see here is that the com computation of the eigenvalues of a perfectly nice toplets determinant, this one over here, becomes a problem of finding the zeros of a toplet determinant with a Fisher-Hartwick symbol. So if you want to know the behavior of the eigenvalues of the toplets matrix, you change your symbol and you just evaluate the asymptotics of the new, new symbol. But the new, new symbol 
has to include these special hardwick sing uh, singularities. Now, uh, uh, let me just mention a few, one or two more, uh, more examples. Uh, when T is less than TC in the I Ising model, you have this representation for, for the symbol. So in other words, it's something with one, one singularity. Alpha zero is zero, but beta zero is minus a half. This minus a half is important, as we'll see. When T is bigger than TC, it's a similar story, but now beta zero is equal to minus one. So the bottom line in, in the whole story is just that uh, a lot of these prob problems can be included in this list of uh, Fisher-Hartwick sing uh, singularities. Okay. Maybe I'll just leave up the Fisher Hartwick singularity for you to bear in mind. Over there. Okay, so now what's the basic question? With F having Fisher Hartwick singularities, how does DNF behave when N gets large? So, right in the beginning, when they introduced these singularities, Fisher and Hartwick made a con conjecture. They said that DNF should look very similar to the case when V, when uh, the alphas and beta are zero, except for one fe fe feature. There'll be an extra um, uh, growth, uh, growth rate or d d d d decay rate, which is polynomial type in N, poly polynomially bound, uh, bound. So in addition to this, this piece over here, there'll be an n to the sigma where the sigma is expressed in this particular way in terms of the alphas and the betas. They made this con co con conjecture on the basis of certain explicit com computations for some constant e, and they didn't say too much about e. They just uh, had a few of its prob uh, properties. But this should be the form of the solution. So uh, this was the challenge. Now, if we take V, V, Z, you remember V, V, Z is sitting over there. It's E to the V, V, Z. And you expand it out in its Fourier co 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 coefficient. You separate out the positive pieces, or, or the positive VJs and the negative V, V, v J. So B plus of V uh, of Z is analytic in the interior of the circle, and B minus is analytic in the exterior of the, uh, of the circle. This is the Wiener-Hopf uh, factorization of the symbol E to the V. And we let g of z denote the bonds g function. So uh, you notice that if instead of g here I had gamma, instead of gamma I just had z, I would be writing down the relation for the gamma and gamma function. So this is like a second integration, as it were, of uh, log z. And the g, g function has many beautiful properties, and in, in, in particular, uh, the basic rule is this, whenever you're getting a product of gam gamma functions coming up in, in any problem, you can re rewrite it in terms of this G, uh, bond G function. That's, uh, that's how things appear. And uh, following some earlier work of a number of people, Widom, uh, uh, let me just not run through the now, uh, of Harold Woodham, Lenard, and Estelle Bessot. Could you go back to the definition of the genes again? Because that's a little hard to get. Okay. This piece, you mean? Those yeah. yeah. So you just take e to the v, yeah. and you factor it as something analytic inside the circle. That will be d, v plus, something analytic outside the circle. You take off the diagonal term. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so following on the er earlier work of uh, Lenard, Widom, and uh, Basil, uh, we let F. Uh, well, uh, this is a, re a result which is proved by ba uh, Basil. Yeah, so suppose that these numbers have the proper property that alpha j plus or minus beta j are not negative integers. 
non, uh, are not neg negative in I integers. Then, as n go, goes to infinity, you get this huge expression coming out. Things to fo uh, focus on, if you leave this piece off, this piece off, this piece, this, and this piece, these are constants. The second part, the third part, the fourth part, and the fifth part are con constant. This is what you'd get if all the alphas and betas were zero. This is what you get in the uh, fischer hartwig con conjecture. The rest is this constant E, explicit representationally. It's a uh, marvel that people were able to get things. Now, you see, this con condition here is impor important because if this is a negative integer, then 1 plus this quantity here is a is a non-positive number, a non-positive integer, and hence it's just going to vanish. So what's really going on, this condition is just ensuring that the term you're getting is in fact the bona fide leading term. It's not zero. So the details of it, of course, are not that Im important at this stage, except for the message that we have the exact answer. So this particular form is due to Estelle Basel. I think. Yeah, and it's no, 1978, yeah. and it follows on from work which uh, uh, Widom had done, where he proved exactly the same result, but with all the betas being zero. She uh, she required that the real part of the alpha j's be bigger than min minus half, which is no re no additional re restriction and that the real part of the beta, beta j is be zero. So it's not yet the complete stor uh, story. Okay, uh, so the methods which are being used here are uh, operator theoretic type methods. So operator theoretic type, uh, type methods. I'd have to go back a little to my talk yesterday to say uh, how they see. They're based on ideas of Widom. Heroism's ideas. Okay. Okay. So as I say earlier, Widom had prov proved the results. So whenever I say three, I mean this asymptotic form for So he, he he had proved it in this case. Now eventually, in 1999, er Erhardt, who was a student of Bod uh, Botka and following on the work of Botka and Sil Silben, proved three under these conditions. So the real part of the alpha j is bigger than minus a half. These are not negative integers, so that we are picking up the, lead, you know, the leading term. But there's this other mysterious con con condition, that the seminorm, that the difference of the real part should be strictly less than 1. So that was the status in 1999. And the question then began to arise is, is this condition that the seminorm be strictly less one, is it just an artifact of the methods or something really going on? Does the asymptotic break down? So uh, I just want to take a moment. I'll come back to this discussing an example, which, um, okay, this is the one. Okay. Uh, so, uh, all right, so this is it. Here's, here's an example which uh, Tom knows very well. It's the following. For our symbol, we take for t a some real, real number e to the minus i pi t times a characteristic function of the upper circle. This is a function, clearly, which is equal to e to the minus i pi t when beta is between 0 and pi and equal to 1 otherwise. This, uh, so this is a Fisher-Hartwick symbol, which can be written in these ways. All the other factors drop out. So it, lo it looks like that, and the other factors dro uh, drop out. So z0 is 1, z1 is mi minus 1, and zb is 0. Now, if we use 3, we see that the determinant for this symbol should go like some constant times, there's an exponential piece here, but an n to the minus beta 0 squared minus beta 1 squared, which looks like e to the minus t squared over 2 times this. Now, suppose we do a terrible thing. Right? We put t equal to 2. Now, if you put t equal to 2 up here, this just becomes e to the 0, or e, 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 e to the 2, 2n pi, 2 
n i pi, which is just one. So this determinant associated with phi has just got to be one. So this asymptotic cannot be true for such values of phi. There has to be a breakdown somewhere, somewhere along the y so that something has to go wrong. Well, whether t equals two is the critical point here or not, that's left open at this point, but you notice the following, that exactly when t equals two, beta one, or when t, t equals two, beta one minus beta two, is going to equal, v, uh, these are the betas, here's the values, so if I put t, t equal to two here, beta zero is one, beta one is mi minus one, this difference is two, so which is bigger than one. So something's going on, question is open whether mod beta equals one is the critical value. Uh, just want to make one other remark is that when we go back to the for formula three, it does include the case where we're at t equals t, tc, because at t equals t, t, tc, we've got one such singularity, and beta zero is a half, which so alpha plus or minus beta is not a negative integer. And then you plug that in, you get e to the minus beta squared, you get n to the minus a quarter, which is the famous decay rate, which was first obtained by Fisher, and then by uh, Yang, uh, by Wu. Now you see the following, if t is bigger than t, see then beta zero is one, alpha zero is still, still zero, so alpha zero plus or minus beta zero takes on the values plus or minus one. If we put in mi minus, we've got a negative integer, so although the theorem we had, three, applies, it gives us zero because of the g, g function. And if we work it to higher and higher the polynomial order, we're still going to get zero because we know from Fisher's re result that when t is bigger than tc, we should get in, be getting an exponential decay, something beyond all orders. So in other words, here we're again back in the situation where the Ising model posed a problem to us. Now it's posing an additional problem. How do you go beyond all, all, all orders? So Yeah. Yeah. It's easier. Yeah. It, it's just easier. So you're getting things from the le leading order, but now to get what's going on, which is exponential decay. Yes. See, everything else is going to be apart from this e to the v type thing, right? right? Everything else is of a polynomial order. Okay. We don't want polynomial order. We, we want, want more. more. So we've got to do more. So you're right. Uh, we're used to thinking of t bigger than tc being yeah. easier, but there is this problem here. Okay, now getting back to this qu uh, qu 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 question. Uh, is beta equal one a critical value? So now something very curious happens, and I really don't know another analog of this phenomenon. Question arises, if I give you a symbol like that, are the coefficients alpha and beta uniquely determined? That's the, uh, the issue. Well, suppose it's easy to show that the alphas are uniquely determined, but what happens if you change beta to beta hat and you add on integers n, j to each one? Then you find that if you're using betas and you're using beta hats, the new symbol you're going to get with the beta, uh, beta, beta hats is going to be related to the other symbol by these NJs which you've used in precisely this particular way. Everything else stays, stays, stays the same, but these things are going to change. So what that means is that if you pick NJs whose sum is zero, then you've got a new representation a different re representation, uh, fisher hartley of the same object. Now, and hence the determinants of the set. Now, per se, this is not a pro problem, but now something really strange happens. If you use formula three with beta, and you use formula three with beta hat, they're different. They're not the same. So what that means is that it's again. Does formula three apply in this case or not? That 
that's the conclusion you have to come to. It means that they can't, they can't apply in both cases. That's the conclusion. So it's a different in, I, I indication that there has to be a breakdown in the applicability of these forms. And it's a different piece of evidence, so I'll go. So it's a very strange thing that the asymptotic formula will depend on how you choose to represent it. Now, the clue as to what is going on was discovered by Baser and Tra Tracy in the early nine. So I want to go back to this example. You remember we had minus i up top and plus i up It's very similar to that pro problem in phi t we were looking at when you put t equal to 1. You'll get this. Then by direct com computation, they showed that the asymptotics of D DNF looks like this. In particular, if n is odd, it's just 0. When n is even, it's, it's just 2. Next, they observed that f, in this particular case, f had two particular representation of fisher hartwood type. The first is you put a singularity at 1 with a bait equal to half. The other, you put a singularity at minus 1 with a beta equal to minus a half. Or you can flip them around. You could put the minus a half there and the plus half there. In both cases, the difference between the real parts of the betas is 1. So something is happening at beta equals 1. Uh, when yeah. Yeah, with this one uh, over here. I don't know how strange uh, it must be, but I, I've uh, never actually uh, gone through it. So that's the first thing. I see in this example uh, that there are two re representations. They give different answers. Uh, and <laughs> what they then observed is that this expression of theirs, over here, this one over four, yeah, four here, is a sum of two, 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 two pieces in which each of the two representations is making exactly the contribution you would have if you would apply three to each of them. So three was the gen general formula. You plug in the values of beta there, you get one expression. You plug in the other beta, get a different expression, you just add them. So the final thing they observed was that they looked at this discrete variational prob prob problem. Take the sum of the real part of the betas, so the one is a half, add to it the n's, whose sum is zero. So your one beta is a half, you put in an n zero, the other is minus a half, you put in an n one. And then they observed that this variational problem, in other words, minimize this quanti quantity here, subject to the sum of the n's being zero, was minimum at two places, n0, n1 equals zero, or n0, n1 equals minus one and plus one. So it's a very nice little exercise to give to, to one stu student to, to compare the qu quadratic constrained vari variational problem in the continuum case where the answer by con con convexity is unique with the discrete case where the answer may not be unique. So this variational pro pro problem has two, two solutions, and then they observe that these two solutions of the var variational problem are giving you your two values of beta. Your one value of beta is just you add zero, zero to your other value of beta is you obtain by putting minus one in. So somehow the relevant betas beta hats that you have to use have to come from this vari variational problem. Then they made this extremely bold con uh, conjecture. So let alpha j's and beta j's be given, and the real part of the alpha j is bigger than mi minus one. Then you look at all beta hats you can get from beta by adding it to, uh, to it these n's, subject to the sum of the n's is zero. So that's your set m. That's the orbit through beta. And now you look at the variational pro problem. You minimize this quanti quantity over all such n's whose sum is zero. And you look at all the betas which minimize it. All the minimizing betas. So it would be these two betas over here in our case. Over here. 
Then the conjecture was the following. If this uh, is not equal to a negative in integer, then the asymptotics of your, your term is exactly just the sum of uh, all these betas in the minimizing set, where the expression you use for this is expression three. Yeah, no, this ex exact example, just that one example. <laughs> Nothing bigger than that at all. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, it's when you're looking at an answer, right, it's a sum of the evidence and imagination. Sometimes the evidence is small, but the imagination is big. Okay. Now, this, when you think about it for a moment, is really a very strange business. Uh, let me try to explain it in, in the following way. Suppose you go to a supermarket and you buy some goods and you come to the cashier and you hand in your credit card. The name is John Smith. So he goes in and then the cashier comes back to you and says, isn't your name also John E. Smith? You say, yeah, my name. Well, John E. Smith also owes some money. Then he looks again and says, aren't you also known as John E. Smith? Yeah, I'm known as, well, John E. Smith also owes some money. In the end, all your aliases have got a debt and they all got to pay. And the computer finds it, and strange enough, the mathematics finds it. It finds out all the names of the symbol, says all of them have to make a contribution. I've never, I don't know any other situation like, uh, quite like this. The mathematics finds out you know, its big brother is watching it, and it pulls them all out. Okay. So uh, this is a why I say it's a matter of uh, <coughs> hidden identities or aliases. Now, we were able to prove, prove this con conjecture, and I want to say a little bit about that. Um, uh, so our approach to prov proving the con con conjecture uses the asymptotics of polynomials which are naturally associated with the symbol, even though the symbol is not real. So pi k and pi k hat are two monic polynomials which satisfy this relationship, that pi k of z and pi m hat of z inverse integrated against this a zero for m not equal to n, for k not equal to m. For you can show as part of the proof that uh, when k and m are sufficiently large, these polynomials actually exist uh, a priori. They may not exist for some fin uh, finite values. Of course, if f is positive, uh, they will s s certainly exist for all k and m. Now, but because they're orthogonal, there's nothing they are, yeah, they are orth orthogonal in this per so it's a bi-orthogonal set. If f is real, then pi hat is just uh, something like the bar of the other one. Okay. So we use uh, Riemann-Hilbert nonlinear steepest descent uh, techniques to find the asymptotics of these polynomials. So the main features are these. Remember the ZZJs are these points on the uni unit circle. So this is an oscillatory factor. But these DJKs will have this polynomial type decay or growth given by e to minus 2 beta. So what's important are the real parts of the beta j. So you begin to see that the real parts of the beta j, which goes into the definition of the sense at seminorm, is starting to show up. Now, these are explicit con uh, constants. And this asymptotics you can get provided the sem seminorm is strictly less than 1. So we have the asymptotics in the case where you have there are similar form formula for pi hat and for pi and its higher derivatives at the point zero. So something similar to, to, to that is true. So the de details aren't, aren't important. It's just to rea realize that we know what the asymptotics of these, of these polynomials are when the seminorm is strictly less than one. Now, putting aside for the moment uh, the com com computation of D DNF, I just want to make a remark that this result. These are all on the surface. Yeah, no, I'm. Um, yes. Uh, usually this is everything on the line. Well, I'm about to. Yeah. Exactly. So, toplets and Henkel and Henkel plus top, uh, toplets determinants can be obtained. 
cla class of results when your uh, Hankel deviation is defined on a compact interval. On the whole line, of course, you face all the problems of essential self-adjointness uh, self and clear questions like that. So, so let's leave, leave it. There. But suppose I've got a function on the interval minus 1 to 1, w, and a function f on the circle. And suppose they are related in this particular way. So necessary, this function f at minus e, e to the minus i theta is equal to f of e to the plus i theta. And then you construct the Hankel determinant from that. So it's very similar to the to Toplitz determinant, but this is what you do. You take your weight, you compute the j, pi j plus k mom mo moment, j and k run from 0 to n, and that's the Hankel determinant. Now there's a for formula which we found is that this Hankel determinant is related to this square root of a toplet of this particular to toplet determinant in this particular way. And what intervenes are the orthogonal polynomials with respect to this weight f. So if you're in a situation where you've got a symbol f and you look at a matrix which is of toplets plus Hankel form looking like this, it can be expressed in terms of such an object and hence in terms of this. So any asymptotics for symbols F uh, and associated sy sy symbols, uh, any asymptotics for F with or without fischer hartwig singer singularities are going to give you asymptotics for Hankel and toplets plus Hankel, again with fischer hartwig type sing uh, singularities. Uh, there are many applications of this. In particular, one of our main, main applications is to this work of Keating and Gooey, where they uh, uh, do different things connected with L, L, L functions on the line, line half. They have various con conjectures, um, which I was going to write out, and uh, we were able to verify their con con conjectures by plugging in our, uh, our in other words, the Tracy Bathshaw conjecture into this particular situation. Okay. There are also many other applications in statistical mechanics. Um, uh, okay. So that's it. So the first task in proving the base or tra Tracy conjecture is to solve the discrete variational problem. So, so how do you actually solve it? So Given a beta, we call O beta, the orbit through beta. It's all the beta hats you can get by adding nj's to sum as zero to your given beta. We saw that object coming up. Now this is the first fact, which is elegant but extremely simple to prove, is that B beta, which is the minimum of B, B beta as it runs over the entire orb orbit, is less than or equal to one. Now, you can see that very easily in the following one. Suppose that B hat, in other words, the, uh, is any quant quantity on the orbit for which B hat is bigger than 1. So that means there are at least two, a J and a K, such that the real part of beta J minus the real part of beta K has is a distance bigger than 1. So this distance over here, so these are a whole collection of be be beta Js. Here we've got a lot of beta j's with the same real part, maximal, and same real part, minimal. But this difference here is bigger than 1. So let's go down, down to here. So what you can do if this distance is bigger, you can take one of these and move it a distance 1 down. You can take one of these and move it a distance 1 up so that the sum is 0. The sum of the ends is 0. And what you've done is you've produced a new beta hat from it wh whose semi-norm is less than or equal to, to the original. You can keep doing this. You can pull this one down and then pull, pull that one up until you can't go anymore. So either what you've done there, you've squeezed it all into one interval, or you're in a situation where one is a distance one apart from the other. And if you try and interchange them, you don't gain anything. So that's why you're Minimum is less than or equal to 1. Okay. Now, uh, all right. So we introduce the idea of exchange by saying we can go from one beta to some other beta shock by just doing such an action. You subtract 1 from one of the guys, 
and add one, or you can do S of them. You can subtract one from S of the uh, betas, and you can add one to S of the betas. So that would be an exchange. All right. Now, this is the next part, part of the theorem. We know that B bait, which is the minimum of the orbit, is less than or equal to 1. There are two alternative terms. If the minimum is strictly less than 1, then there'll be a unique beta hat on the orbit, which achieves that, uh, that value. And that value of beta hat is what sits. It's the unique element in the minimizing set for the vari variational parabola. So if beta hat is strictly less than 1, there's one beta on the or or orbit which attains that value, and that is the unique beta, beta hat sitting in the minimizing set. On the other hand, if B, B of beta is equal to 1, then all the beta hats on I in the orbit which attain that value can be attained from each other by exchange. So you can move one guy sitting here, one guy sitting here. You can move this one here, move this one up here, and that's all the all the betas you can get. So, uh, so the ba basic theorem is either this is strictly less one, or, or, or if it's equal to one, all the beta hats in the minimizing I in uh, which are all the values of beta which attain this is precisely the set of betas which sit in this minimizing set over here. So, if you want to see uh, an example here with the beta for Tracy and ba Basel. The semi norm of the beta is 1. The orbit through uh, beta for which beta hat equals 1 is just beta equals a half minus half or minus half plus a half. The one can be attained from the other by taking one from this and adding one to that. So it can be attained by exchange. And you can observe that uh, both of these minimize this quantity subject to that quantity. So what we have done is we have written down what the solution of the variational problem is it's a nice problem to give to one's student. Okay. Now, in case one, where you have a unique uh, beta, beta hat, the result of er er error imply implies immediately. So in other words, you go to your or orbit, you pick out the unique one, the unique be beta hat in, in the orbit whose seminorm is less than one, and you apply Erhardt's theorem number three to that one. So just to see how it works, let's go through this example, which uh, we've discussed with Tom on many occa occasions. Here was our phi. Beta hats are a t, a two, and minus t over here. Now, if t is less than one, the semi-norm for here is just given by t, and that's less than one. So you plug that in, and you get this asymptotic. If t is now bigger than 1 and less than 2, the beta hat you want is t upon 2 min minus 1, t minus t over 2, plus 1. And that's the object that you plug in, and so on. Okay. Now, so that's what you do in k k case 1. In case 2, you let beta hat be any element in this orb orbit. We know there are more, th more than one. So all of these objects are going to be obtained one from the other by, by exchange, and they'll all be sitting in an I interval of precise length one, or semi semi norm one. So they're all sitting in an interval where b is equal to a plus one. And we let l be the number of beta j hats in this object, which are equal to b. In other words, on the right, and P, the number on the left. So here we've got L equals 2 and P equals 1. So what you now, now do is you take all the guys on the right and you move them to the left. Once you've done that, you get a new symbol, which is beta tilde, which has a semi-norm strictly less than 1. Now, because you're just moving things to the left and nothing to the, to the right, the sum of your nj's is a negative num uh, number. And so you no longer have that f 
of beta hat is equal to f of be beta, but you get some other factor, v to the l, coming out. But the good news is that beta hat is a symbol for which the seminorm is strictly less than 1, and hence result 3 of Erhardt applies. I should just, uh, let me just make a, a remark here that you have to do a similar thing to address the issue of T bigger than T, 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 C. You've got one winding, you take it out with such a factor. That's what you have to do. Now, there is a general theor uh, theorem which says this. If F is equal to Z to the L times this, and you compute the determinant of a product of a fischer hartwig symbol times just Z to the L, then it will be the de determinant of just this guy over here with some explicit factor here. And this factor here is an L by L determinant, so L was the number of guys you moved from, uh, from the right, which is expressed in terms of the polynomials associated with this symbol. And you remember when we've got a sy symbol whose seminorm is strictly less than one, we know how to analyze these guys asymptotically. So we plug in that asymptotics, and you remember we had these factors, dj, zj, to the end, you plug it into them. Now comes the real crux of the matter. If you look at this expression over here, we see that we have moved all the betas from the right, extreme right, to, to, to the left. So all the ones on the left have got the smallest real part. Any others, because it's e to the minus beta, those are going to give you the leading co contribution. So you can throw out from the sum everything except the j's, which correspond to these now p plus l elements in beta, which were moved completely to the left. Of course, I remind you that what was important was e to the minus 2 beta j till this is, so the real part of this quantity is what's in. So you end up with this, and you can evaluate this d and d determinant. It gives you your van, van der Mann squared. You get something like this. You immediately see that the j1 equals j2. This drops out, so in the sum over here, you just want to have a discrete. Now, uh, so this is what your fn looks like. You marry that together with the uh, asymptotics that you had from uh, 3, from um, Erat, er, and the final answer pops out at that particular point. Okay, now, so uh, we just want to summarize this a little bit, is that, so we take our gen gen general set symbol and we can convert it basically into a symbol for which er Erhardt's result works with a term z to the l thrown in. So the terms of the pro product can be expressed in terms of the determinant of the Erhardt type symbol together with something about the orthogonal poly polynomials. We now to, to evaluate the, uh, the asymptotics of the orthogonal polynomials. We just plug that in and we calculate what com uh, comes out. When you put everything together, you've got to use this property of the, the G, G function, and I just want to give you some, some sense of how the thing all fits to, uh, together. So what have we done? We've got L objects here and P objects here, and we move these L objects to, to the left. So we've got L plus P objects sitting over here. So how many ways can we take from these L plus P objects, L objects, and move them to the right? It's L plus P over L. Okay, that's the number of terms in. But that's exactly the number of elements which are in this minimizing set M, because that's what you can do by exchange. That's how the numbers uh, add up. I, I don't want to, it's te technical, I don't want to lose people any more than I might have already. So that's how the thing fits together. So now the story of the impetus of Ising on toplets carries on, and we still haven't gotten to the really interesting problem. So uh, the next subject which com com comes us are block toplets. They look exactly like 
ordinary toplets, it turns except each of these CKs is now, instead of being a one by one matrix, is now an L by L matrix. So such d determinants actually first arose in the Ising model, model through the work of Li and Yang, with their fa famous paper on the zeros of the partition function. So in the ma magnetic field, we know that they said that all the zeros necessarily have to lie on the imaginary axis. So they were focusing on the imaginary axis, and they actually were able to obtain explicit form uh, formulae for the free, uh, free energy and the magnetization at this very strange value of h. So at the first value of h, they were able to compute h upon kb is equal to i pi over 10. So they obtain expressions for that. So uh, it arises, and uh, it's important that to know this quantity because it tells you how the zeros of the uh, partition function accumulate at the point min minus one. So they got that. Then shortly afterwards, McCoy and Wu were able to verify these results by noting that this correlation function could now be expressed as a two by two block toplet steam determinant. This is with the magnetic field. With the, at this very special, very value, very special value. value. So, uh, by an ingenious set of man manipulations, they're able to reduce this steam, this block D determinant, to a product of toplets terms with scale scalar symbols, and then they could use the SSLT. Now, uh, so many block toplet steam determinants are now known to arise in various physical situations. A different Ising uh, case arises in what's called the brickwork lattice. And uh, these guys were able to show that there were these next nearest interactions. So this guy here, the black guy, inter interacts with these, the nearest neighbors and the next nearest neighbors. And if you compute the so with those interactions, right, ne plus or minus one, same thing, yeah. and able to, uh, they were able to to analyze it, again in terms of two, two by two toplets determinant. Based on, er, 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 Erard looked at a di dimer model on a, tri a triangular lattice, and they compute. Well, let me ask you about that. Can they, can they get, can they get the quarter? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I would have to look. Uh, we can without look. Without magnetic field. Right, without magnetic field. Then they look at, um, on the tri they look at the diamond, diamond model, and they look at uh, monomer mono and monomer in 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 interactions. Again, it can be expressed in terms of toplets, in terms of two, two, two by two, uh, ent uh, with two, two by two matrices. A different kind of example or a different kind of problem is the in, 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 is an in entanglement problem on the XY quant uh, quantum chain. And um, there is a com com computation of the von von Neumann en en entropy, which started with the work of Jin and Korepin, then a group around Kitaev, and then uh, they uh, finally it's Jin and Korepin were able to analyze it. But again, it would be in determinant with uh, uh, with ma matrix blocks. Now, in all these cases, the relevant de determinantal asymptotes have been obtained su successfully, but the methods are somewhat ad, ad hoc. There's no general way to proceed, and the reason is, is the following. As in so much of toplets theory, you have to go back to Widom, and uh, Widom showed that in the block to uh, toplets case here, phi is some suitably smooth L by L matrix value function on S1. Uh, if there are no singularities, if there are no. It depends. No, 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 Peter, let me, uh, let me. It's hard if you're on the whole line. Yeah, right. On the whole right, line. Right, right, right. We're only speaking about things where yeah, you, you may. Yeah. 
second. I think uh, th there is no simple way around it that I know of. I don't know if that uh, you got to use. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what Widom's result is very ele elegant. Now, phi is a matrix value fu function. As you compute the toplets determinant, you look at this as your exponential factor, and the answer comes out explicitly. It's a determinant of T phi and T phi inverse. And now T phi is the toplets operators acting on little l2 plus raised to the power l where you've got now got a semi-infinite ma matrix, whereas before we just had fi finite sections of it, but you look at that whole, uh, whole operator. Problem is how to evaluate this. Uh, in the sc scalar case, um, Widom realized that you could use this famous Helton Howe Pincus form formula to show that this particular object was this exponential term, which is familiar to, uh, to, to us. But it remains a very open, it's very much an open question of how to evaluate this particular thing in the gen in general terms. So what one is able to do in these three or four examples, that I mean, there's a way around it which is specific to those particular problems, but there's no general approach. So the, the, the even though problem is just a simple Fisher Nile matrix, yeah. it's a problem to the truth. Absolutely. So that's it's already a problem right there. Already not, it's not, a problem. Not, not Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, oh, there are some ideas. <laughs> okay. So, uh, now I'm saving for the last two or three minutes what is really the best for last. The deepest challenges to to Toplitz theory from the Ising model come from the scaling limit, or what physicists call the scaling, mathematicians call the double scaling limit. One wants to know the behavior of this cor correlation function as n goes infinity, not just at fixed t, t less than critical, t equal to critical, or t bigger than critical. You want to know what is happening when n goes to infinity and t goes to tc at some prescribed rate. In particular, people are interested in this particular scaling where n times t minus is some fixed value r. So in 1976, in an absolutely landmark paper, Wu, McCoy, Tracy, and Baruch showed that under this scaling, this correlation function could be expressed in terms of the, of the solution eta of a panel of a three, three equation. This was like somebody ringing a bell. Right? It's, uh, in this way, Panlevé theory awoke from a long period of latency and has now emerged as the core of modern spe special function. It really comes from this, uh, this example. Uh, as before, questions that Ising asked, that the Ising model asks of Pan Panlevé theory rather than Ising asking questions of to uh, Toplitz theory have really guided the direction of pan, pan levee theory being developed in exactly the same way, and particularly the key qu question <coughs> about connection for formula comes up here immediately because you want to know that the solution of pan levee three that you've obtained, which is normalized when r is large, has the right behavior when r goes to zero. In other words, you must get your one quarter decay rate coming. So that's a connection que 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 question. The behavior at plus infinity with the be be behavior at zero. So immediately you face this basic que question of nonlinear non functions here. Now, from a physical point of view, uh, double scaling limit is particularly Im important because it's believed that the scaling limit is universal for a broad class of spin, uh, spin systems. I don't know how much is known, known about but that's certainly a claim which yeah, one sees. So I would like to end both these talks with a quote from Andrew Lennard from 1972. So this is the quote. Somehow, whenever people work on uh, these kinds of things, they become poetic, right? So it is the author's hope. This is Lennard 
writing in this paper. It is the author's hope that the rigorous analysis will someday carry through the results to the point where the true role of the zeros of the generating function will be understood. When that day comes, a capstone will have been put on a beautiful edifice to whose construction many contributed and whose foundations lie in the studies of Gabor Zago half a century ago. So this is written in 1972, and uh, we're still working on this one. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely, for sure. So that's how that's how they function, yeah. how they merge, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's uh, that's what the Sada Miwa Jimbo the and uh, all the guys The Asamonodromi, the Asamonodromi, the Deepmayin, the I guess. So how do you s how do, can you sort of intuitively see that that these are Asamonodromi? Well, so um, <laughs> so the uh, thing is going to wor work in the following way: you've got some points in the plane, and you've got a Fuchsian system. You've got a differential equa equation with singularity as the point, uh, point there. Yeah, but yeah. Where, where does that come from? I mean, I'm looking at really thin spin mm -hmm. in, in, in some scaling, yeah. you know, some massive scaling. Of okay, but, okay, but no, no, I'm, I'm just addressing it as an isomonodromy problem. Okay. okay. I'm just, okay. Uh, you just uh, then what you do is you, so you've got points in the plane, right? Different points in the plane, uh -huh. and you connect them. Like that, yes. and then you observe that if you start on the upper lip yes. and you go around, you get some one, uh, some uh, mon monodromy, and you get all the monodromies by going all around. This for a solution start, uh, starting here, you go around and you see uh, observe yeah. the uh, the. Yeah. Then you ask, you look at your uh, Fuchsian system, which has sing singularities and co coefficients, mm -hmm. and you ask, how is it? that these coefficients and these poles should move in such a way that those monodromies don't change. Don't change. And that, that, of course, is, is and that gives it, that's right. That's, 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 where, uh, that's where it's coming so from, right. But how does that connect to, to, I mean, how do I see that Eisen in the mass of scaling is, is, is related to Fuchsian yeah, okay. systems? So yeah. do I take the log of the partition function? Uh, I or don't see it. Uh, I, see I, I probably I take the log of the two-point function and show it a basic differential equation like a Hirota equation. Uh, let me, I, I see it differently. Whether I would see it, see it I would have to think about it. Okay. But I see it differently. Okay. I see that I write down one of these determinants, yes. for, uh, for example. He has to be given the answer. Yeah. <laughs> then he sees it. <laughs> yeah. And then I explain it to you. I think Jimbo and these guys, they the tau function. Yeah. 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 That satisfies those two. Yeah, so yeah. they're, they're, they're Herodotype uh, equations, uh, I believe. Those are, yeah, but that's not. That's no. not that's the not way that I, 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 I okay. said. That's and how I got interested <laughs> in random matrix theory. I couldn't understand this differential equation until he explained that's it right. to me. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Because Meta in his book just verifies the equation. Which I said, all right, I can also check compute that it satisfies the yeah. equation by verification. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't think yeah. of it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that is really Jimbo Miwa. Yeah. The first to see that is Jimbo Miwa. Yeah. Miwa. Such yeah. Such yeah. Such yeah, but following on this work of Baruch and Wu and that, oh, that, that, that they did it first. Yeah, they, 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 did, they really no did first. That. So the way I think about <coughs> it so go, goes like this. You're looking at, suppose you're looking at the gap prob uh, probability, the determinant of 1 minus the sine, a sine curve on some that's interval. Yeah, okay, that's okay. the case they are yeah. looking at. Yeah. So the way I see it is like this. That's associated with the Riemann Hilbert problem. That Rie uh, Riemann Hilbert has very special properties. The jump matrices, if you take out some factors, yes. um, is constant. It doesn't vary as you vary the parameters. So you've got y plus.